there are two equations up on the board, each of which describes a nuclear reaction. One of them is fission, one of them is fusion. Can you tell me which one is which? Top on fission, top on fusion. Right? How do you know that's fusion? Yeah, we're taking two light nuclei and forming one heavier nucleus. And there's a neutron there and some energy there. We're not worried about that so much right now. It's important later on. But for now, it's just what's circled in blue there. Two light nuclei become one heavier nucleus. That means the bottom one's got to be fission then, right? Can you tell me why, Caitlin, the bottom one's going to be fission? Good. One heavy nucleus becomes two lighter nuclei. And again, you got the neutrons there on both sides. You got the energy produced as well. That's neither here nor there for us in identifying what type of reaction it is. It becomes important later on. So we got a nuclear fusion reaction and a nuclear fission reaction, both of which result in energy being produced. Which one produces more energy? Which one produces more energy? Well, it depends on how we ask that question, actually. That's a little bit of a trick, okay? I'm going to create a little table for you, and we're going to fill in that table. We did it yesterday, just did it in a slightly different format here. We're going to have list three reactions. The first one is the fusion reaction that's listed up on the top of the page there. Then we've got fission, and then we're going to introduce a chemical reaction. You're never going to have to balance a chemical reaction or do anything with a chemical reaction in physics 30, but you should know how the energy of a chemical reaction relates to the energy of a nuclear reaction. All right, two columns in this table. We're going to say the first column is going to be the energy of one reaction. And the second column is going to be the energy per kilogram. So in the first case, we're just comparing raw reactions. In the second case, we're comparing apples to apples. If you've got one kilogram of each, then which one produces the most energy? All right. If we're looking at the energy of the reaction, just one single reaction, which one's going to generate the most energy? Fusion, fission, or a chemical reaction? It's going to be fission. Yeah, it's going to be fission. So that's going to be number one. Which one's going to produce the least amount of energy? Chemical reaction, definitely. And then fusion must be the second then. So fission produces more than fusion when we have one reaction taking place. But what about when we're talking about apples and apples? In other words, we got one kilogram of each or 100 kilograms of each. Which one produces the most energy then? Fusion. And chemical produces the least and fission produces in the middle there. So remember that chemical reactions always produce less, re less uh, energy, no matter how you compare it, than nuclear reactions. Fission and fusion swap places. Okay, fission uh, gets ranked first when you're talking about the energy of a single reaction. Fusion gets ranked first when you're talking about the energy per kilogram of a reaction. Okay, what else do you know about these? Well, we know that this produces, these products are radioactive which means they're going to be harmful. This product ends up decaying really, really quickly. And it, it is radioactive, but it decays so quickly that it's not really, you don't really have that radioactive waste that's left behind. So the products of this, we would say, are relatively harmless. We don't want to say completely harmless because it is radioactive, but a half an hour after this reaction takes place, it's essentially gone. It's decayed to normal background levels so that you don't have to worry about the radioactive effect of that. All right, there's our little comparison of fusion reaction, fusion reaction, and to some degree, a chemical reaction. We defined two terms yesterday. We'll go through them once again, and then we'll describe them mathematically here. We describe math, mass defect in two ways as well. Uh, one, in the context of a single nucleus, we said that the mass defect is the difference in mass between what makes up the nucleus, or in other words, the nucleons. Nucleon is a proton or a neutron. I think Philip told us that. We're going over one of those practice questions. 
the nucleus itself ends up weighing a little bit less. So yesterday's analogy was if we had 25 people in this room, everybody weighing 100 kilograms, we would think the mass of the classroom should be 2,500 kilograms, but it's not. It's 2,497 kilograms. The mass, the total mass ends up being a little bit less than the mass of the components, the nucleons that make it up. Why is that the case? Well, because that mass is in a different form of energy. We call it binding energy. That binding energy is quantitatively equal to the amount of energy that would be required to take apart the nucleus, to separate the protons and the neutrons from the nucleus. Here's another analogy. If I take a 100 gram block of ice and I put it with another 100 gram block of ice, what would you expect to get? 200 grams of ice. But if I put a 100 gram block of ice with another 100 gram block of ice, maybe I only end up with 199 grams of ice. Where's the other gram? It's been converted to something else. It's not gone entirely. It's not like we've just created something or destroyed something. It's just in a different form. It's in liquid water as opposed to ice. So that's kind of the same thing here. Okay, we've got the mass of all of you guys adding up to give me slightly more than the mass of the classroom, or we've got the mass of all the nucleons adding up to give me slightly more than the mass of the nucleus. That's okay. We're missing a little bit of mass there, but that mass is just in a different form, a different form that we call binding energy, kind of like the liquid water was. Now, that's in the context of a single nucleus. If we describe these in the context of a nuclear reaction, then we would say mass defect is the difference in mass between what we start with and what we end up with. We always end up with a little bit less mass than what we start with. In other words, the daughter, or you could say the product, is a little bit less than the mass of the parent, or you could call it the reactant. Mass of the products, less than the mass of the reactant. It's not by much, but we do lose a little bit of mass. Where does it go? Not just like the ice water analogy again. It's not like we've completely destroyed it. It's just now in a different form. It ends up being in the form of energy, binding energy, the energy that gets released from the nuclear reaction. In both cases, if we want to calculate the binding energy, all we're going to do is take the mass defect, however we got it, this way or this way, and multiply it by the speed of light squared. That gives me the binding energy of a particular nucleus or the binding energy of a reaction, which ends up being the energy that's released from the reaction. All right, let's do an example then. We're going to do two of them, actually. Uh, first one says, determine the binding energy in the following nucleus. The binding energy in the following nucleus. Now, in order to do this, you have to be given some data. And you're not given data here. So I'm going to give it to you right now. Everything that I write down in green is going to be what would be given to you on a test. Okay, if I write it down in another color, it's something that we're doing. Got it? If it's green, it's a given. It's just not given to you quite yet. And if it's another color, it's something that you have to be able to do yourself. All right, we're going to say the mass of a proton is 1.67283 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Now, if you look on your data sheet, it actually says the mass of a proton is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. We're just giving you a number that is a higher degree of precision, more decimal places. In order to do one of these problems, you need that higher degree of precision information. It would have to be given to you in a table or buried in a page of information separate from your data sheet. Okay, you would also have to be given that the mass of a neutron is 1.67438 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. You see it weighs pretty much the same as the mass of a proton, but go to the third decimal place, it's slightly heavier. Not much, though. And we're going to say that the, the mass of barium, the entire nucleus, is 2.339 One seven nine two four times ten to the minus twenty five kilograms. 
All right, there is the information that's given to you. Let's solve this now. Any ideas as to how I might go about that? We want to find the mass defect, or sorry, you want to find the binding energy, you need the mass defect, right? How do you get the mass defect? Right, the mass of barium minus the mass of all the protons and neutrons combined. Let's figure out how many protons and neutrons we have so we can get the mass of all those protons and neutrons combined. And then let's subtract it from the mass of barium here. So let's multiply the mass of the proton by 56. We have 56 protons here, right? So the total mass of the protons will be 1.672 times 56. And that gives us 9.36784848 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. Hey, okay, there's the mass of not one proton, but of 56 protons. That's what I need because that's how many protons barium 141 has. Now, how many neutrons does barium 141 have? It's going to be 85 neutrons. We're going to say 141 minus 56 gives me 85 neutrons. We multiply those two numbers together. We get 1.423223 times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. Now, let's combine these. Let's add these up. The mass of all the protons and all the neutrons combined should give me 2.36000075, I think it is, times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. Now what? Oh, we're so close, guys. We're so close. Now what? That should be 78, actually, not 75. We're going to subtract them. Somebody this morning said, well, which way do we subtract? Final minus initial? Or really, it should be initial minus final because the initial is bigger than the final. It doesn't really matter. If you subtract it the other way, you're going to get a negative number. Just drop the negative and make it positive. The mass defect here is the difference in mass between those two values. It's going to be 2.36000078. Times 10 to the minus 25, subtract 2.339-17924 times 10 to the minus 25. Subtract those, and we end up getting a mass defect here of 2.08. Man, the numbers are crazy here, but I think it's logical, isn't it? Like what we're doing? It's just that we got these ugly number of decimal places. You gotta be careful about that. But I think if you're careful, I think you can nail this. 2.082856 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Now what? Last step. Last step. Now what, Philip? Yep. Times it by the speed of light squared. So we'll say E equals MC squared. This number goes down there, times it by 3 times 10 to the 8 squared. We end up getting a value here of 1.87 times 10 to the negative 10. And what would the units for that be? Yeah, we use standard units through the question. So we're going to use standard units for a final answer. And those standard units are joules. Now, strictly speaking, with the way that I have this written, we should be going to, oh, I don't know how many, five, six significant figures because there's nothing in it that's rounded to anything less, right? Other than these numbers, which don't count. But the reality is, on an assignment question, a quiz question, a practice question, a test question, they would have put something in there to make you round to three or four digits there. Philip? Well, that's true, actually. Yeah, no, that's true. The speed of light counts, actually. So it should be three digits. You're absolutely right. Um, on your data sheet, it says 3.00 times 10 to the 8. So there you go. There's your number right there that takes you to three significant digits. Good. Okay, let's take a look at question number two. This is our fission reaction that we've seen a couple of times already. A neutron bombards uranium-235. 
produces krypton, barium, and then three extra neutrons and some energy. In order to do this, you need to have the following data. A neutron has a mass of 1.67438 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Again, what's given to you in green here is going to be data that would be provided to you on a quiz or a test. Uranium-235 has a mass in kilograms of 3.90173 times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. Krypton-92, not kryptonite, Krypton-92 would have a mass of 1.52597 times 10 to the minus 25. Barium-141 has a mass of 2.33918 times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. And three neutrons have a mass of three times 1.67438 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. There you go. There's the information that would be provided to us in one form or another. Now let's find the energy that gets released, the binding energy. Binding energy always comes from two words. Always comes from mass difference or mass defect, right? So let's get the mass of the parent side, and let's get the mass of the daughter side. The mass of the reactants, the mass of the products. When we add up the reactants or the parent, we end up getting 3.918.47 times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. On the other side, the daughter side, or you can call it the product side if you want, we get 3.91538 times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. Which one's heavier? The parent or the daughter? The reactant or the product? Look at it. There's not much of a difference here, but you can tell pretty clearly if you go to the third decimal place, that what we start with is heavier than what we end with. The difference between those two numbers is called the mass defect. So let's subtract those two to get the mass defect. And when we do subtract those, we end up getting 3.08802 times 10 to the minus 28 kilograms. And on that mass defect, we've got to find energy. And we're going to use equals mc squared to do that. Taking the value of the mass defect, multiplying it by the speed of light squared, we end up getting 2.78 times 10 to the minus 11. And the units, again, would be joules. Okay, I'm going to give you some data, for example, number three, that you're going to complete at home tonight. Hydrogen 2 has a mass of 3.36. 355-034 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Now remember that there's two of them, so make sure you account for that. The mass of helium-3 is 5.0066814 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And the mass of a neutron, same as it was before, we did the other questions, 1.67438 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Get the mass defect. Once you have the mass defect, get the energy. And once you have the energy, you're done. All right, I just want to show you one more thing that we could see under the auspices of uh, fission, fusion, radioactivity, whatever. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I doubt that we will. I can't recall a, a single time in the last 20 years that we have seen it and used it on a test or an exam. 
I wouldn't say it's never happened. I would just say that in 20 years, I can't recall it happening, which means it certainly hasn't happened very much if it's happened at all. I don't think it has. But these units are on my data sheet, so I need to be familiar with them just in case. This is really and truly what I'm about to show you, a just in case kind of thing. I want you to recognize that both of these correspond to mass. An atomic mass unit corresponds to mass. It's technically defined as one twelfth the mass of a carbon-12 uh, nucleus. But we're given the conversion factor on my data sheet. On your data sheet on the left-hand side, everybody should look at your data sheet, actually. On the left-hand side of it, you can see uh, at the very, very bottom of that first category there under constants, it says one atomic mass unit is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So what do you do if you get a question like this that's, that you've got masses given to you not in kilograms but atomic mass units? Change them. Convert them to kilograms, that's all. You just got a unit that you're not overly familiar with, but that's okay. As long as you know what the conversion factor is, change them. Let's say we had 3.5 atomic, 4 atomic mass units. We would say 1U over 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms equals 4 atomic mass units over X. Solve for X, the amount of kilograms, and then do your thing. Now, we've got a similar issue with this other one, MeV per C squared, mega electron volts per C squared. This is a unit of mass as well that we don't normally see used in physics 30, but we have to be ready for it just in case because it's on your data sheet. But we're not told what the conversion factor is for MeV per C squared. I don't see anywhere where it says 1 MeV per C squared equals this many kilograms. So here's what we got to do to do the conversion for that. Take a look at the right-hand side of your data sheet, the very right-hand side of your data sheet. It gives you, under the category of first-generation fermions, the mass of an electron in MeV per C squared. It says the mass of an electron is 0.511 MeV per C squared. But we also know, if we look up the page a little bit, the mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. So we have to kind of make our own little conversion factor there. Now, if you were given 3.5 MeV per C squared, how would you convert that? Well, we'd say 0 0.511 MeV per C squared over 9.11 equals 3.5, or whatever the number is, over X. And solve for the kilograms, and then do your thing. We don't ever want to do calculations in atomic mass units or MeV per C squared or any other units for mass for that matter. All we got to do is convert. If we got grams, it's easy. If you got atomic mass units or MeV per C squared, hopefully it's easy now. We're not going to do any questions with this because I think it's uh, not a very good use of our time. But you're ready for it. Okay, if something happens, you do see this, that one in a 20-year kind of event, um, you know how to deal with it at least. Convert it to kilograms and then do what we just did.